Returning to the Old Testament tonight and to the prophecy of Isaiah, back to the book of Isaiah again and chapter 33. Isaiah chapter 33, take your time and get the place and keep the word of God open. At these verses, solemn verses, <clears throat> that the Lord has laid upon us tonight for this meeting. And we're in Isaiah chapter 33, and we're reading from the verse 14. Verse 14. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness hath surprised the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? And who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? There's one kind of people in verse 14 and there's another kind of people in verse 15. And at the end of verse 14, you will read these solemn words. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? And who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Now, just because it doesn't say there, that whosoever is in a devouring fire or in the everlasting burnings doesn't mean that we can't apply these verses to hell. And that's what we can do, and it's very solemn. But then in verse 15, we have another type of people. We have the sinner in verse 14. And we have the saints in verse 15. He that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly, he that despiseth the gain of oppressions, that shaketh his hands from holding of bribes and stoppeth his ears from the hearing of blood and shutteth his eyes from seeing evil, he shall dwell. Now he's de dwelling in a different place. There's the same word in each verse, dwell. He shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be the munitions of rocks. Bread shall be given him, and his waters shall be sure. Thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty. They shall behold the land that is very far off. And we know that God will bless to us the public reading of this solemn word to our heart. Those that gathered here this morning will know that we spoke uh, on the subject of godly fear. And I took from my text the 50th chapter of Isaiah and verse 10 where the prophet asked that searching question, who is among you that feareth the Lord? And I pointed out that the, the prophet Isaiah, uh, the crowd that he was speaking to and addressing, didn't all fear the Lord. Because when you're reading scripture and you take a phrase, you need to take it carefully. Because he asked the question, who is among you that feareth the Lord? And of course that indicated there were those around the periphery of those whom he was speaking to did not fear the Lord. And we applied that and we applied what the fear of the Lord is. And there's a CD there of it if you, if you want to listen to it again or if you want to listen to it. But this phrase, among you, captured my thoughts for 
a bit of time during the week. And uh, I soon discovered that the prophet didn't only use it in relation to fearing the Lord, but he used it on a number of other occasions as well. Now, you needn't turn to this, but in the 42nd chapter of his prophecy, he, he, he speaks of it in relation to hearing the word of God. He says, who is among you that will give ear? And who will hearken to hear? But he didn't only use it in relation to fearing and to hearing. He uses it in the 43rd chapter as well in relation to declaring who among you shall declare this and show us the former things. And when we come to our reading here tonight, we discover again that he didn't only use this phrase among you in regards to fearing, hearing, declaring, but regarding burning. Burning. Because in Isaiah 33 and verse 14, and I have already pointed it out, he says, who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? And who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Do you know that has to be the most daunting couplet to be found in the Word of God. Devouring fires and everlasting burnings. Now I want to rub it in as the Holy Spirit rubbed it into my life and mind. We are reading about something that is awesome. Devouring fire and everlasting burnings where people shall dwell. Sinner in this meeting and those watching and listening to me, take heed. And saints of God in this meeting, take heed. Because if this is true, and it is true, and we have scores of other scriptures to back it up, then there's people going to dwell, not sojourn, to dwell in devouring fires and everlasting burnings. Does that concern us tonight? Does it really concern you tonight and me that this is the truth of God's word? To receive a burning is a fearful and a painful and a shocking thing to receive a good thorough burning. But to dwell in everlasting burnings is beyond comprehension. Five times in five verses in Mark's Gospel, chapter 9, Jesus speaks of this. Jesus speaks of this. And he speaks five times in five verses, and he uses this phrase when he's speaking about hell and everlasting fire and everlasting burnings. It shall not be quenched. Not quenched. Not quenched. Not quenched. Not quenched. Not quenched. Now, do you think our Lord's fooling? Do you think he said something five times in one blast to be accorded by the Holy Spirit in the Holy Word for us today? Do you think that is true or not? 
Do you think, do you believe tonight really in your heart that there's a never, that there's a devouring fire and everlasting burnings and there's the, 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 there's the lake of fire where men and women throughout the countless ages of eternity will be crying and they'll be burning and they'll never burn and they'll be falling and they'll never fall and they'll be crying and they'll never cry out and they'll be in torments and it will never end. If there was some sight, if there was some, something in sight for them, perhaps a million years down the line, it would be some wee thing to click on to, but there's not. There's not. They're still weeping and wailing and gnashing of their teeth down through the countless ages of eternity. But the question is this, who among us will dwell there? I'm not asking you, did you make a wee profession when you were a child? I'm not asking you, did you mutter out some wee prayer to please a preacher or to please your mother or father or somebody else or to get an evangelist to go away from a mission saying that there was nine or ten souls saved and maybe nobody saved? Because when it comes to this, this is reality. Who among us? Are you really sure beyond any doubt tonight that you'll not be in this place? Who among us in our homes? Who among us in our schools? Who among us in our universities? Who among us in our workplaces? Who among us in the congregation where you sit on Sunday morning? Who among us shall dwell in devouring fire and everlasting burnings? And there's an S on it. So I'll give it a wee minute to sink in. Well, do you know who's going to dwell there? Sinners. Sinners. Sinners who have never been to Jesus for the cleansing power washed in the blood of the Lamb. Sinners who have never really known what it says to have sins forgiven and peace with God and assurance of heaven. Sinners who never had that experience and know it and show it in their lives. Sinners. But this verse says here in verse 14 where the sinners are, and this is a shocking statement, sinners, the sinners in Zion. I want to let that sink in. Because Zion speaks about the people of God. Zion speaks about the church of God. Those who today associate themselves with Christian churches and Christian ministry, who sang the hymns today and maybe tonight and chanted creeds and prayers, are baptized and they, they take communion and they have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. They're sinners in Zion, in the very heart and the midst of the church. And God knows Northern Ireland's full of them. And this is an awful deceptive thing. Thousands in our land this morning attended churches and the traditional churches and services and they came and they've gone from the place of the holy today. But oh, my friend, blinded and deceived by the devil, just like that, they're out into eternal burnings. It says here, sinners in Zion. And the Lord Jesus says, not everybody that says, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Not everyone. As he says, depart from me, I, I never knew you. It's going to be an awesome, awful thing for thousands of people to hear that word of the Lord, depart from me, I never knew you. Me, Lord, yes, you. Well, I sang in the choir and I read the Bible and I preached and I prayed and I 
footed about like all the rest of them, but oh, I never knew. I made a wee profession when I was young, I never knew. The Lord knoweth them that are his. But you see, there's something else in this verse. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has surprised the hypocrites. They're hypocrites, you see. A hypocrite is a play actor. That's just what it means. It means that he's going through all the things, everything going on, just as we do. Yes, we go through the whole ritual and regalia and everything else. Just hypocrites at times. Well, hypocrites is a play actor, and, 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 and it says here, the sinners in Zion, they're afraid fear has gripped them and surprised the hypocrites. You see what is happening here now, as far as this verse is concerned, the Holy Ghost is working. And there's fear coming on these people. Fear come upon the hypocrites. They get afraid. Fearfulness surprises them. Just like a dart, it's, it hits them. That's the Holy Ghost work. And that's what we need to see working again in our land. And that's what we need to see working in your heart and in your life. Where you can sit under preaching like this and you're not saved and it doesn't cost you a thought. I tell you, there's no fear of God before your eyes. But you see, if you sit under preaching like this and you realize that what this is saying and this is God's word and this is God's truth and that's going to be where I'm going to be, then you'll get afraid. You should be afraid to leave these seats tonight. Because they got afraid. There came a moment in their life when fear suddenly gripped them and that's God's work. They were seized with fear. And if the threat of everlasting, eternal, devouring flames doesn't scare us, what will scare us? The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Fear not him that can kill the body, but fear him that can kill body and soul in hell. Are you afraid? Is men, as sinners out there afraid tonight of these fires? Where Jesus says, where there's weeping and wailing? Fear. Fear of God. Not a, not a, not a slavish fear that I was speaking about this, this morning, as I was saying. It's not a slavish fear. It's a reverential fear. It's not a fear. It's not a fear of God hitting you and hammering you because you sin or you fail or you fall. We all do that. That's not the fear of God we're talking about. It's the fear of sinning against God. It's the fear of hurting God. It's the fear of wounding God. It's the fear of doing something that grieves Him because the Holy Spirit lives within you and He, Christ, in me, the hope of glory, and we can't do that. Can you do things? Are you doing things and saying things and going places that grieves God and it doesn't affect you? Well, there's no fear of God before you. You see, there has to be a fear of God. And we don't want to do that. We don't want to do it. We don't want to hurt God. We want to grieve God. Not afraid of the future. Not afraid of being found out. You so, so many is afraid of being found out. What would that man think or that woman think or what would my neighbor think or what would the preacher think? What would anybody think if they knew I said that or done that? That doesn't matter, my friend. What does God think? Fear of God is a, is a great and lovely and beautiful thing, a holy fear of a holy God that you don't want to grieve him or hurt him or quench the spirit or grieve the spirit or hinder the spirit. And when something comes upon you that you know is not right, you flee from it and you run from it. Just the very reason I don't want to wound the heart of the eternal God who loved me and give a son to die for me. I love him and I don't want to wound him. That's it. That's the fear of God. He's not standing over you with a stick to hammer you if you fall during the week. The 
fear of God. But then there's the fear of man. And the fear of man bringeth a snare. Oh, I tell you, that keeps many back from Christ. In Revelation 21, there's a list of those who will be in this place that I'm talking about tonight, the, 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 the lake of fire where there's the eternal brimstone. You read in Revelation 21, it tells us the type of people that will be in it. Now hold on. All classes of sinners of different shapes and sizes. Talks about the idolater and the sorcerer and the sodomite and the murderer and the liars. Ah, but they don't top the list. They are not the top of the list. They're down the list. Oh, I'm not a sodomite and I'm not a murderer and I'm not a liar. No, no. But you know what the list tops with? The fearful and the unbelieving. So that brings you into it, doesn't it? You're not saved yet, you're an unbeliever. You're not saved because you are an unbeliever and you say like people have said to me, in the, I don't believe the gospel. I don't believe the, about the blood and the cross. and I don't believe about those things. I'm going to live my own life and do my own thing. It doesn't matter a button whether you believe it or whether you don't. It's not going to change things. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. So the second, the second one is the unbeliever. The first one is the fearful. The fearful. The fearful. Oh, I'm afraid what she would think. I'm afraid what they would say. I'm afraid what the people at work would say. I'm afraid to take a step. I'm afraid to do anything. I'd rather just go on the way I'm doing. I don't want to upset the apple cart. I don't want to hurt anybody. I don't want to do anything. My dear friend, you're heading for the everlasting burnings. That's what my Bible teaches me. That's what Jesus teaches me. That's what the Word of God teaches me. And that's why I must preach it in this day when we never hear it. If you wanted to be to put it like this, it's far more truer than heaven because it's preached far more times by the Lord than heaven is. There is a hell. There is a burning hell. And to think that the fearful and the unbelieving will top the list. Who among us, maybe your brother, maybe your sister, maybe your wife, maybe your children, a son, a daughter, going as hard as they can this night. For the only place they can be going to without Christ is hell. The only place. And the only reason, my friend, that people are going there tonight is that they have rejected the gospel. They have rejected the God. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Do you think it's easy to preach like this in these days? Well, I can tell you it's not. Because everything that's coming at us in these days is God is a God of love and, and, and mercy and grace and he is all these things and we hammer it out from this pulpit day and day and day and day daily. But we must get back to these old truths and these old facts of reality that men and women are facing and we are the, we are the, uh, the generation that's responsible for them. 
And I honestly believe in my heart, and I have said it before, that there will be children of Christian parents all through eternity in the everlasting fires cursing their parents. They never told me, and if they did tell me, they didn't take it serious. All they did was make money and build houses. All they did was talk about other Christians. I never seen anything in my home. I never seen anything. Oh, they went to church and they read a Bible and all them, and they had a wee daily reading and all them, but I never saw any concern in them for my soul or for the souls of the people around. God forbid that they'll not say that about us. Because there are those among us. And they will dwell there because they have rejected the only truth and the only word and the only way to salvation. And my friend, all I can say tonight, wherever this is going across the world or wherever, all I can say tonight, flee from the wrath to come. Flee to the ark. Flee to Christ. Flee to Calvary. Why do you think God gave his only one and beloved son, the creator of all things, the eternal God who is holy, harmless and undefiled and separate from sinners? Why do you think he gave him to this world? To be stripped naked, to be nailed on an old cross, to be crowned with thorns, to have his back beaten like a ploughed field, for the tongue to cleave to, to, to the roof of his mouth, and his visage marred more than any man as he heaved there on that old cross of Calvary between the two thieves. Why? Tell me why. If there's no hell. Was it for fun? Was it to start the church? No, no. He, he, he suffered and bled and died for us that we might have eternal life. He is the only barrier to hell that is and ever will be. How shall we escape again? I say, if we did like so great, it's so great. He's a great Savior. He's the only Savior. Christ died for the ungodly. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And he hung and expired there on that old cross. As I tell you, if the commandments could have done it, or the miracles, or the parables, or the raising the dead, or the blind, or the Sermon on the Mount could have done it, he could have went back into heaven again, but he had to go all the way. He had to finish the work. He had to destroy death and hell and the devil and to give us eternal life and the whosoever will may come. He bore the fires of God's wrath so that we'd never go into everlasting burnings and never forget that and never miss it for all the other paraphernalia that's going on around us in these days. I, there's a people and there's a person and there's a permanency because it says that the text shall dwell. You see, hell has no exits. You want me to say that again? Hell has no exits. There's no emergency doors out of hell. Hell has no exits, sir. None whatsoever. The fire will not be quenched, and the worm dieth not, and there's no way out. In Luke's Gospel 16, the Lord tells us a story which is not a parable, 
which is a real literal story of the rich man in hell, and we know it inside out, some of us. And the rich man died, and in hell, he lifted up his, he never once asked to get out. Because he knew there was no use. Because the word came back from heaven to him, there's a great gulf fixed. And there's no way out. He never asked to get out. But you know what he did ask for? He asked for missionaries. Oh, yes. Because, read it when you go home, he says, I have five brothers. It was a right family of them, six boys at least. He says, I have five brothers. I'll tell you, he was, I don't know whether he was concerned. He didn't seem to be too concerned when Lazarus was sitting at his gate. But as soon as he hits hell, and just as soon as he hits it, a five brothers, don't let them come to this place. Send Lazarus. And I don't know how he got on with the brothers, and I don't know what the brothers did, and I don't know anything about them, but I know the cry from the flames of hell. He says, I'm tormented in this flame. And he's still there the night. He says, I'm tormented in this flame. Don't want my brothers to come here. Do you want your brother to go there? Your son? Your daughter? Well, let me give you a wee bit of advice. Get in, get in here on Friday night at half past eight. And let the Lord see what your concern is. I don't want them to go. He says, send missionaries. He asked for mission and he asked for mercy. Father Abram had mercy. That's too late for mercy. Too late for mercy for him. But it's not for you. So, who among you? Hmm? I wish I knew. I could go down and sit beside you if I knew. Who among you? That's the sinners, and I'm closed now. But that would be an awful place to leave this meeting, wouldn't it? Dangling over hell. Maybe we should leave it there. But there's a saints in verse 15. Walking, speaking, seeing, hearing. Comes down to verse 17. Thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty. What a contrast. Dwelling forever in God's heaven. And our brother here that sang, prayed in the prayer meeting tonight, and I caught it on when he prayed it. Lord, we want to see you in your beauty. See, the Lord is ways of confirming messages. In your beauty. Not in his holiness. And boy, to see Christ in his holiness and in his righteousness and in his purity. 
but we shall gaze upon him in his beauty. He's the altogether lovely one. There was a time when we saw no beauty in him. But the moment we get to heaven, we'll gaze upon him in all the beauty. You can spend a thousand years gazing, you're going nowhere anyway. Maybe a million years. Just gazing on his beauty. And what does it say? They shall behold the land that is very far off. I tell you, no missile will strike it tonight. None of man's rockets that are whirling about in orbit will touch it tonight. It's a far off. But I'll tell you this, he has brought rebels like me now. It's not too far away for him. He came from heaven's glory. And one day it'll be just absent from the body, present with the Lord. And we'll dwell forever when we see the King. Are you going to see the King? Are you really sure? Are you really certain? If you're not, I pray you'll not sleep tonight. I pray that you'll smell the sulfur from hell. I pray for your heart, for your sake tonight, that you'll have an uncomfortable tonight, night, until you flee to the, from the wrath to the refuge of the Savior. Let us pray. Father, it comes down to this vital question to my heart and to everybody else's here. Do we really believe? That there's everlasting burnings where sinners will dwell. And Lord, we have to assent and say yes. And Lord, forgive us. Forgive me, Lord, for believing this and not being serious about it. Oh God, Lord of a brother tonight, are we out in Vancouver? An atheist, dying. Lord, I can't save them. But my passion, my burden for him, I must confess. Is not great. Lord, we have wives and husbands and children and sons and daughters. God forgive us if they'll ever rise up against us. God forbid that we would play the fool with the gospel and these truths that we're so privileged to have in Northern Ireland. Oh God.
Lord, there's wee children coming up through this church. And we pray for every one of them, Lord. Oh God, if only we knew from we stood up in this pulpit tonight until now how many have slipped into this awful place. And while we sleep and while tomorrow goes on and the night goes through, it never stops. Father, have mercy. O oh God, revive us again. Thank you for help given, Lord. This word is a word from God. And we don't want anything to undo it. We don't want anything to take away from it. We don't want to be the cause of hindering someone tonight so part us in thy fear and with thy blessing for Christ's sake